Uh, hi, I'm Skinny Cheeks. Today I'll be going through the Update 41 patch notes to get you caught up for all the changes coming for the Scions of Athelia DLC, coming on March 11th for PC and March 26th for console. In an effort to keep this from being too long, this video won't contain super in-depth breakdowns of the changes, but instead this is here more as a refresher to combine the past five weeks of PTS updates for those that haven't kept up with the changes, or for those that have but might have forgotten what all is coming. If you are interested in digging in a little further into each of the topics, I do have a playlist linked down below of all of the coverage I've done so far on the PTS. There are quite a few videos I've put out going through all the changes, so definitely recommend checking that out if you want a bit more in-depth analysis. And though this is more of an overview here, I will be throwing in some insight of things I've learned along the way. First up, like the other dungeon DLC packs, there will be two new four-player dungeons coming, Bedlam Vale and Oathsworn Pit. For those that don't typically have ESO+, Plus, if you were planning on purchasing these dungeons, it may be a better value for you to just grab a month of ESO+, Plus instead, as they are giving away the collector's edition of this for free to all ESO+, Plus members. This will last for two weeks for both PC and console once they've launched on March 11th and March 26th. And for those that already have ESO+, Plus, you still get a free mount and pet, and you'll get to keep the DLC if you decide to cancel your membership, so make sure to claim that before it runs out. And then as usual with dungeons, there are three five-piece sets and one monster set coming from each of them. Sadly, I'm not too impressed with any of the gear. I did a pretty thorough breakdown of the sets and gave my feedback on them, but we didn't really see any improvements to the dungeon sets over the course of the PTS. There are also three new rewards for the worthy sets coming. The light one seems pretty decent. It could be a good amount of stats on that five-piece bonus if you are going up against someone with a lot of buffs, though none of these really blow me away. We also have a new mythic coming, Torque of the Last Aelid King. This one is a little strange in that it disables all of your other set bonuses, but it does have a pretty nice, well-rounded list of stats here. Definitely think it could be nice for some casual play and convenience, and have seen a lot of people suggest that it will be good for no CP Cyrodiil, where proc sets are not usable, and also as a dueling mythic. Next up, we have some additional base game features coming. We're getting the style pages for the class sets. I like the designs of these pretty well, and they all have a unique effect on them. And this will show up if you have at least five pieces equipped, and that counts towards the styles as well. So as long as you use five parts of the style page for that class set, then you'll get that special effect. One downside is that you can only use the styles on the class that they're made for. So I can't wear the Necro outfit on my DK, for example. I've seen a lot of complaints about this, but it doesn't appear that they are changing their minds on that one. We'll see if that changes down the road. Next up, Stackable Siege is a long requested feature that will be coming as well. These will stack up to 20 now, so that should help with a good bit of inventory space. They're also increasing the Undaunted key rewards. Now, I've seen a few people get this one wrong when talking about it. It says here, this does not affect quests offered by Glirion the Redbeard or Maj Alragoth. So this is only for the DLC dungeon pledges, but you will get two, three, and four keys for each of those different difficulties rather than one, one, and two. I would like to see them increase the other undaunted quest givers as well maybe also add in some more items to purchase with keys but this is at least a step in the right direction and then as is typical with new updates we have some new homes and furnishings coming along with a pet that you can get by doing a prologue quest and some body markings you get with telvar all right, moving on to the combat changes. There are quite a few here, so I'll try to be concise while still pointing out some big takeaways and things you should account for when setting up your characters for update 41. Again, I will have the playlist of patch note videos if you want to dig a little deeper. So first up, they made some changes to taunt, mostly back into stuff to make sure that it's a bit more reliable. I won't go through all of this here, but it should now be a bit easier to avoid causing a target to be taunt immune. Next, and probably the biggest overall set of changes coming are to status effects. They buffed most of them by quite a bit. I was originally going to put a section in here digging into all this, but it was ending up very much not on theme with my concise decision for this video, so I'll likely have a separate video coming out talking about the status effect changes and what those mean for our builds, including our enchantments and weapon traits. But it will be far more common now to diverge from the typical flame and poison enchantments we've been running if you have high uptimes on burning and poisoned already in your setup, and we 
we might even see some classes using non-weapon damage setups for pure single target DPS. And then to go along with the status effects, they did nerf charged. They reduced this trait's increase of applying status effects to 235% down from 365% to make up for the large increase in performance of most status effects. So charged is still really good. In fact, many single target setups will move to full charged on the front bar now. For AoE, for most classes, I'd probably do Nern Precise still or Precise if using a bow or staff. This is just a very general overview though. There will be different setups that will want to take advantage of different configurations. Next up, Major and Minor Vitality updated these buffs to increase healing received and damage shield strength by 12% rather than increasing healing received by 16%. And then the same thing with Major and Minor Defile except debuffing with those. So this is just an additional way to increase and decrease shield size through the Major and Minor system. All right, now we'll get into the class changes, starting with the Arcanist. Fate Carver reduced the damage done by this ability and its morphs by about 7% per tick. And then the Pragmatic Fate Carver morph reduced the potency of the damage shield this morph offers by about 16%. Then they fixed an issue where the shield did not have a max health limit like other shields. This shield is now limited to 50% of your max health. So long story short, Beam is still the strongest ability in the game and the shield on Pragmatic is still awesome. Arcanists are not going anywhere. Next up is Psychic Lesion, reduced the passive's increase to applying status effects to 55% down from 75% to make up for the status effect buffs in this update. Still a decent passive there, this doesn't really change a whole lot with that. Next is the Imperfect Ring, they increased the radius of this to 6 meters up from 5, including the Synergy, and then on the Rune of Displacement morph, they increased the radius to 10 meters up from 8. So that is a pretty large AoE pool now. Next up, we have the Dragonite Combustion. This passive now increases your damage done with Burning and Poisoned by 40% up from 33%. This passive now grants 1,000 Magicka and Stamina whenever you apply Burning or Poisoned rather than granting Magicka for Burning and Stamina for Poisoned. So this is really nice for Sustain. No matter the build, you get back both of those resources, especially for tanking. This will be a really nice change since you typically aren't triggering these as often as a damage dealer would. That damage done increase is not really too noticeable with the charged nerf. It seems like that was just done to make sure they weren't losing too much damage there but overall seems like about roughly in the same spot for damage as before and similar to arcanist dragonites are pretty much doing the same thing in update 41. Next up is the Necromancer. The big change is the rework to Blast Bones. They changed the base morph and the stalking Blast Bones morph to be a self buff ability. This makes the Blast Bones charge at you instead of the target and increases your damage done with class and damage over time abilities by 15%. It also makes your Flame Skull ability deal AoE damage on every third cast and leave a corpse at your target. And then for the other morph, Blighted Blast Bones, this morph's overall functionality remains the same to retain a way for the original playstyle of the skill to be kept. Reduce the base cost of this morph to 1836 down from 2295 so it's easier for non-stamina focused builds to sustain. And remember that will also be cut in half from the reusable parts passive so it's a pretty cheap skill to cast. And then they also made it so that Blighted Blast Bones always applies the disease status effect on hit. This is a pretty decent damage increase having that damage in there guaranteed now especially with diseased dealing more damage to this patch than it did before. So overall if you like the old necro play style I think you'll want to swap over to Blighted now, it should get you pretty similar results to what Stalking did before, though it is a bit of a nerf for high-end gameplay. I did a pretty thorough breakdown of this though in one of my videos. It's in that playlist I have for patch notes if you want to dig into that more. Next up with the Necromancer, they changed Death Knell, increased this passive's critical chance to 10% per ability slotted while meeting its conditions up from 8%. This is pretty nice and many builds will be sitting near 100% crit chance in Execute now. Then they fixed that bug with Shocking Siphon where this ability and Morph's damage were not properly creating the area of effects around the corpse they were targeted on. All right, next up is the Nightblade, Deathstroke, Incapacitating Strike, increased the damage done of the enhanced version of this ultimate by 10% and extended the duration of its effects to 12 seconds of from 8. This ultimate no longer grants Reeve for slotting. So this is not a huge change aside from losing that sustain, but often you end up casting this at over 120 ult, 
due to uncontrollable circumstances. So this is a nice little buff for those situations, getting the 12 seconds out of it instead of the eight. And then for the Soul Harvest morph, this morph slotted bonus now persists through bar swap. So if you wanted to slot this on your back bar for some reason, you would still get the ultimate back from kills. Next up is Concealed Weapon. This morph now deals 10% increased damage at all times and deals an additional 10% damage for 15 seconds after leaving stealth or invisibility. Rather than granting Major Berserk, this morph's Minor Expedition and Conditional Requirement now persist through bar swap. So this is a pretty big nerf here to the Nightblade's damage overall. Major Berserk was a 10% damage increase to all of your abilities. Now the skill just gets 10% for itself. I do prefer Concealed Weapon to not be the source of a buff ability like Major Berserk, but unfortunately that power taken away from Nightblades was not put back into their kit in any other form. And this form of Concealed is just a bit underwhelming. I gave some suggestions in my video going a bit more in depth into this topic if you are interested in checking that out. This next one wasn't a note from the patch notes, but Surprise Attack did get a small buff. Since Surprise Attack is guaranteed to proc Sundered and they increased the power of that status effect, this is a bit more appealing now. It does seem to fall short of Rapid Strikes by a small amount, though this difference is increased if you are using the Maelstrom two-hander since Rapid Strikes benefits from that on every single tick. Next up is Debilitate. This morph now increases the chance of applying the Overcharge status effect to 15% rather than guaranteeing its application each tick now that overcharge does considerably more damage. A lot of people thought this was a nerf at first glance, but for most scenarios it will be about even since you'll have close to a 50% chance to trigger this for most builds and the damage is now over twice as much from overcharged as it used to be with the status effect increases. Siphoning Strikes reworked this ability and its morphs to be simpler to use while making their resource recovery more engaging. When activated, the ability will instantly drain 4,000 health to restore 2,000 Magicka and Stamina. When the ability is slotted on either bar, any damage you deal will heal you for 1250 health up to once every second. The Leeching Strikes morph increases the healing and also reduces the cost of the skill to cast so that roughly once every 10 seconds or so, you should be able to cast it for free. And then Siphoning Attacks is the morph I'm really interested in. This now increases the resources restored to 2600 Magicka and Stamina. Whenever the heal activates, it also restores 200 Magicka and Stamina. So just for slotting this on your back bar and never even having to activate it at all, you get a ton of healing and resource return. It's a pretty crazy strong ability now. I really like what they did with this. And then you also do have the option there to activate it for a burst of resources if you are in a bind. All right, moving on to Sorcerer. They did some reworking to the ability in case this ability and its morphs now apply major maim to enemies for 10 seconds, and they reduced the base cost of 4050 down from 4320. Then they renamed Restraining Prison to Vibrant Shroud. This ability now heals allies in the area with the same healing potency of Blessing of Protection rather than attempting to immobilize enemies. This morph will continue to apply major maim to enemies in the area for 10 seconds and will also apply minor vitality to allies who were healed by the ability for 10 seconds. Then they increase the cost of 4860 up from 4050. So very similar to Combat Prayer here, except this ability will have different secondary functions when you cast it. So I like this change pretty well. And then they renamed Shattering Prison to Shattering Spines. This morph now deals guaranteed damage after a duration, and they've increased the damage of it by 10%. So this could be interesting for PvP as it will be more guaranteed delayed burst, but it doesn't really hit hard enough to warrant use in PvE. Next up, we have the Shield ability, Conjured Ward. This ability and the Hardened Ward morph will now heal you for 15% of your max health or magicka, whichever is higher, if no pets were shielded by the abilities. So pretty nice little buff here for non-pet sorks who run this. And then for the other morph, Regenerative Ward, this morph now heals you for 10% of your max health or magicka, regardless of if a pet was affected by the shield or not. So this is the smaller shield of the two morphs. So if you do want the heal and you have pets, you'll have to sacrifice a little bit of the shield size to take this morph. If you don't care about the heal with your pets, then you can just keep taking the Conjured Ward morph. Next up, they renamed Daedric Minefield to Daedric Refuge. The mines this ability places are now wards that activate when you or an ally walk over them, granting them a damage shield for six seconds. Allies cannot be affected by one of the wards more than once every two seconds to prevent situations where a singular ally could take multiple shields immediately. The shield uses the higher of your max magicka or stamina and is capped at 43% of the target's max health. So this is another pretty cool support option added in for sorcerers this patch. Then they adjusted 
adopted the expert summoner passive. This now increases your max health by 10% while you have a summoned pet of any kind up from 8% when you have a Daedric summoning ability active. So nice small buff there for pet sorks. And this passive now also increases your max magicka and stamina by 10% when you do not have a summoned pet of any kind. So another buff there for non-pet sorks as well. They definitely tried to go through and make that no pet playstyle a bit more appealing for this coming update. It still doesn't compete with having pets for PvE DPS, but it's definitely closer now. And these should be a very nice set of changes for those using Sorcerer and PvP. And then the last change is to Lightning Splash. Increase the radius size of this ability and its morphs by an additional 2 meters as they were significantly smaller than other class-based area of effect over time abilities. So these will be 6 meters and 8 meters now, depending on the morph that you go with. 8 meters is actually really large, so that's a pretty nice change there. I would still like to see a bit more done with this ability in the future. Next up we have Templars, Power of the Light. This morph now always applies the Sundered status effect when it deals damage, both the initial and the explosion, rather than applying a unique 10 second form of Minor Breach, as Sundered will cover Minor Breach for a duration between. This does mean that Minor Breach can fall off for a very short period if this is your only source of triggering the effect. So this is a pretty nice damage buff for Templars for most scenarios. The Sundered status effect deals good damage now, and it also gives you 100 weapon and spell damage on top of providing minor breach like it did before. Next up we have the Warden. Glacial Presence reduced the potency of this passive by about 50% as the chilled status effect received a huge increase. Overall this will result in roughly a 6% damage increase between both of these changes. So just some adjustments to account for the base chilled proc dealing more damage already. And as they said this is a small DPS increase overall for Wardens. Next up is the Northern Storm Ultimate. Increase the damage done by this morph by 50%. Activating the ultimate now grants 50 weapon and spell damage for five seconds each tick up to a maximum of nine times 450 weapon and spell damage rather than increasing your weapon and spell damage by 300 for 30 seconds. So this is a decent buff to this skill but I don't see it getting a lot of use in PvE still. Next up permafrost reduced the damage done by this morph by about 32% to make up for the adjustments to chilled and glacial presence. Overall this will still result in an ever so slight less than 1% damage increase of this morph so really no change here to permafrost. I did break these a bit further down in my video covering the Warden if you are interested in that discussion. Moving on to non-class abilities, they changed up a bunch of skills to either have guaranteed status effect procs or change the ability type to bleed damage so that we have a few more there to proc the hemorrhaging status effect. So first up with the barbed trap, this morph now increases the damage done on the initial hit of it by 20% and the initial hit always applies the hemorrhaging status effect rather than increasing the chances of applying the effect by 10 times for both the upfront hit and the bleed afterwards. So this is actually a fairly decent sized nerf for this ability. The dot had an insanely high chance to trigger hemorrhaging before, and now it's back down to that 3% that most single target dots get. The upfront hit having the guaranteed hemorrhaging is nice, and overall the ability is still really good to use. It's just not as broken strong as it was previously. Focused Aim, this morph now always applies the Sundered status effect rather than a unique form of Minor Breach for 10 seconds. So this is the opposite morph of Lethal Arrow, which gets the guaranteed Poisoned status effect. This is still the weaker morph unless you need that Minor Breach from Sundered. For Executioner, this morph now deals bleed damage rather than physical damage. This was done to help additional sources of the damage type enter the game to help balance out ways to apply status effects. Lacerate, this ultimate and its morphs now also apply the hemorrhaging status effect each tick. This is actually quite a large DPS boost to these ultimates, around a 45% damage increase for Thrive and Chaos, and about a 33% increase for Rend. I was messing around on the PTS with the Thrive and Chaos morph on trash packs with my Arcanist, and it actually seemed pretty solid. The damage from it, plus the bleed, plus up to 36% total damage done increase for 8 seconds, it's not bad to activate right before a Fate Carver Beam. I'm interested to see if anybody else has checked this out on the PTS so far. I'll definitely want to look at it more, but end of the day, I'm not sure if I see it being better than just front barring Dawnbreaker like we have been and running a traditional AoE ultimate like Fiery Rage or the Languid Eye. Next up is Eviscerate. This ability and its morphs will now also apply the hemorrhaging status effect. So this is a pretty nice buff for the vamp spammable since it can proc both overcharged from being a magic skill and it's now guaranteed to proc the bleed as well. For werewolves, Pounce, this ability and its morphs initial hit will always apply the hemorrhaging status effect. So some pretty good changes to abilities there to allow for a bit better bleed up times than we were able to get before. 
Moving on to the Undaunted skill line, Inner Fire reduced the cost of this ability and the Inner Rage Morph to 1620, down from 2700, reduced the damage of this ability and its Inner Rage Morph by 10%, and adjusted their damage type to Flame Damage rather than Magic Damage. The Radiate Synergy from all these abilities is now guaranteed rather than having a 50% chance to activate from some, and the Synergy no longer has the minimum range of 12 meters to activate. The Inner Beast Morph increased the damage of this by 80%, making it equal to other other ranged spammable attacks. This morph now applies minor vulnerability and minor maim to the target rather than a unique damage taken from the caster debuff. For Inner Rage, this morph now allows up to three allies to activate the Radiate Synergy rather than causing it to be guaranteed since now it's always guaranteed. So overall, some pretty good changes here to this skill. I know some that liked to use the Inner Beast Morph for solo play will not like this change, but I do like what they did with the other morph a lot. It now deals flame damage, it's cheaper, and it grants three synergies. So it just wins across the board for that morph. All right, and then for the last section of this video, we'll just quickly run through some changes they did to pre-existing gear sets. The Master's Dual Wield bonus will now scale off of 20.925% of the higher of your weapon or spell damage, rather than offering a flat bonus based on the item level up to 1635. This will result in a damage loss for most builds that are currently engaging with this set. So you'll end up needing about 7,800 weapon or spell damage to get back to that 1635 amount. For Rune Carver's Blaze, they fixed an issue where this set's damage had a lower chance to apply a status effect than intended. Talked about this one for a bit in a previous video. This is a very nice buff to Rune Carver since it now is treated as direct damage and will trigger a ton of burning on a build properly set up for it. For Tormentor, this set now only taunts the first enemy hit by the ability that activates the set, rather than taunting any and all enemies hit by the ability. Due to this change, the set can now trigger off blinks such as Streak. The set now also heals for 45% of all damage done from the ability that activates the set. Next up is Unleash Terror. Reduce the damage of this set by about 7% to make up for the buffs to the hemorrhaging status effects. Overall, this will result in roughly a 2% damage increase for this set. Next up, Mantle of Sororia. This set's perfected version now grants 129 weapon and spell damage rather than 1096 max magicka, so it now offers all the weapon and spell damage. This is a pretty nice change as well for any build using this, but especially nice for stamina setups who were not benefiting at all from that max magicka line. All right, we made it. Those are what I would consider the most important changes going into update 41. Hopefully this was a helpful reminder of what is coming. And again, if you do have a couple of hours and you want to dig in a bit more, I did go through all these changes a lot more in depth and that playlist will be linked in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about all these changes coming. Big shout out to my current Patreon supporters and YouTube members. The contributions help a ton to keep the website and YouTube channel going. And a special thanks to Nicholas, Simon, Cougars Bay and the Cougar City Guild, the Order of War Guild, Cantankerous Cat, Shady, Iffy, Blake1816, Mordecai1212, Santanico, Vidridi, Florian, Phoenix, Nalandia, Unemployed, Chris Eliana, Cha Cha, Technical KO, Cap, Danco77, and Pletpron. Thanks again and see you later. Uh, bye.